You know you don't deserve that, right? You don't deserve the love of God. You deserve the wrath of God. Say, no, preacher, I'm a good person. There is none good but one, and that's God. Turn with me to Acts chapter 26, please. Acts chapter 26. And we find ourselves this morning considering, examining the testimony of the Apostle Paul and uh, sharing, him, uh, sharing with King Agrippa as he's standing before him in judgment. And I want to focus on one particular thought with you this morning, and, and there's a reason that I want to, to touch on this this morning, uh, besides the fact that God showed this to me again, and that is, and I believe the reason the Lord wants me to share it with you this morning, is because we're living in a time where Satan is, it seems to be running loose. The reins seem to be not being held, if you know what I mean. What happens when you lose the reins of a horse and they fall to the ground? The horse says, oh, they must want me to go faster. And off they go. And it seems like we're living in a time where in the reins, and know this, they haven't, they haven't been dropped. God is still very much in control. But this was the plan. This was in God's on his agenda, on his schedule. What we're having going on in the world today did not catch God off guard. It has not surprised him like the, the, the rider of a horse whose reins have fallen. God very much is allowing Satan to rule and reign right now. You say, well, why would God do that? A God of love. The same reason God allowed it to happen in Job's life. Well, the reasoning might be a little different. Job was a righteous man. We'll get to that in a little while. But God wants to reveal the wickedness in the world. He wants to demonstrate, not for his benefit, but for ours, our wickedness. Maybe you can finish this thought. If God gives us enough rope, we will do what to ourselves? Hmm. Hang ourselves. If you give a thief enough rope, he'll hang himself. And God has given rain to Satan. And very soon he will wrap it around his neck, praise God. Unfortunately, Satan will not be the only one taken up in said endeavor. So Acts chapter 26, we're going to read, I'm going to read starting in verse 13, but I'm really focused a little further down. Acts 26, 13, if you have the ability and strength to stand, we'll do that. Uh, if you don't, then please remain seated. And Paul writes or says to Agrippa, uh, At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven. Above the brightness of the sun, now that's a bright light, shining round about me and them that journeyed, uh, which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But arise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both to these things which thou hast seen and of those things in, which, in the which I will appear unto thee. Verse 17, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Verse 18 is the key verse and contains the key thought that I want to preach about this morning. It says, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. God is about turning men and women's eyes from darkness to light. Getting them to wake up, getting them to see the light. And, and, and guess what? 
Oftentimes, it's not by a life of ease that our eyes are opened, but a life of challenge, a life of difficulty. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inherit among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. This thought that I want to preach about, and, turn, uh, and, and to turn them from the power of Satan unto the power of God. Did you realize that Satan is powerful? He has power. He has authority. <laughs> I want to preach about that this morning and how, I want to end this message this morning with how you can stop him in your own life. See, you have the power to stop Satan. You have the ability, God-given, to halt his activity. Now, understand this. The example of Job teaches us that righteousness doesn't stop, stop Satan from doing evil. but he doesn't have to get the victory over you in the process. And that's what we want to halt. That's what we can halt. We can prevent Satan from winning in our life, in my life. And hopefully, hopefully we'll all have the victory. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning acknowledging that we have a foe, an enemy, a powerful enemy, a scary enemy, one that we can't see. I'm not talking about the coronavirus. I'm talking about Satan, a being you created to reveal sin and, and, and man's sinful heart. And Father, I pray you'd help us. You didn't just turn him loose to rant and rave and get victory. You gave us the power to, to shut him out, to, to, to have victory in spite of him. Father, I pray you'd help us this morning to have great victory. That when we look you eye to eye, face to face, when we fall before your throne, you might say and we might hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I pray that you'd give us victory in this area. That we might listen and heed the warnings and the instructions and that we might accomplish a, a, a great victory in this battle. Father, we pray for your help and we plead that you'd intercede now in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat. I suspect most of you know and understand, at least to some degree, that Satan is a powerful uh, creature. Uh, God created him. I'm not going to go back to Ezekiel and read that. I'm not going to go back and, and look at all of that. But he is a powerful uh, creature. God created, and he has turned, because of his pride, to selfishness and getting the victory. I want to start off... And one of the underlying questions that I hope to answer for us this morning is, how did he get so influential, and, and how did he gain such power in the world? I mean, look around. The world is crumbling because of what Satan has done and is doing. And he has, he has crept into the, the prominent places. I would even go so far as to say most governments Maybe all governments today, Satan is pulling the strings in, at least to a certain degree. Paul here writing or talking to King Agrippa reveals this thought and grasps my heart and my attention. He says that, that God has sent Paul to open our eyes and to turn us from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, so that we might receive the forgiveness of sins. And I know uh, you as well as I need and want the forgiveness of sins, and that we have an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. God speaking. 
Um, I want you to notice a couple of passages as we get started. I want you to, uh, and I would stick a marker in here, but look back at 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 1. <clears throat> or verse 11, rather, I'm sorry. First, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 11. And it says this. And, and, and let me read, let me get some context here. Verse 9 to this end also I did write that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things, to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also, for if I forgive anything, to whom I forgive it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Notice verse 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Uh, here Paul writes to the Corinthian churches and says, uh, Satan has uh, the opportunity or might have the opportunity to get an advantage over us. Now, that's the last thing that we want. I don't like it when my enemies have an advantage over me. I want the advantage. But notice what Paul writes to the, to the uh, Corinthians here. He, uh, lest he should get an advantage over us or of us, but he says, for we are not ignorant of his devices. But to have, for us to have the uh, victory, Paul says, this is the reason that I've written. So that he doesn't have the victory over you. So that he doesn't have an advantage over you. I don't want Satan to have an advantage over me, and I don't want him to have an advantage over you either. Know this, Satan is powerful. Satan is conniving. Satan is... Satan is sneaky, and Satan will sneak in wherever you leave a cracked door. Let me interject a, a, a thought or two. Most of us have a cracked door or two, a cracked window, and I'm not talking about a crack in the glass or a crack in the wood. I'm saying we've left an opening that Satan can sneak into. Some years ago, not very many, but a few, woke up one morning and my kids reported to me that they found a garter snake in the girl's shower. Fortunately, it was just a garter snake. But the question, the obvious question that began to be asked was, how did a snake get into our house? Now, if you've been to our house, you know it's a ground floor house, all right? It's just one level. But when we built the house, I put plywood on all the sides, sealed it up. Uh, we have metal siding with all of the attachments to prevent something from getting inside, other than ants, unfortunately. This is a different message, different story. So the question was, how did a snake get into our house? You know what we found? Somebody left the patio door open in the schoolroom, just a crack. They tend to pull it, and it's so heavy that when it hits the jam, it bounces back a little bit. And if they don't, then try to, in fact, sometimes they latch it, but it's bounced back so far that the latch just pushes it open just a little bit more, leaving room for one of those small snakes to sneak in. One of the other challenges that we have at our house, usually in July and August, is the flies. Oh, I hate flies. But we have all kinds of critters on our farm, and therefore we have all kinds of flies. And for some reason, they like our porch. And that's the door my kids like to use. So all summer, the, my children hear the door, the flies. <laughs> There's fly swatters hanging all over my house. You'd think I own a fly swatter company. I probably should own a fly swatter company. 
But why are the flies in my house? Because the doors open, and flies will find their way in with just a very small crack. Satan doesn't even need that much. I'm not going to incriminate you any further, but I just wonder how many of y'all have a television in your house? Now be honest, I'm not going to pick on you. You just own a television here. I got one, I've got my hands up, right? A window for Satan right there. It's a window for Satan. You need to know that. But guess what? You, you've got the power to close and lock it. Just like the door on my house... You got to have a door on your house, right? It's just the way it is. Hopefully, you keep it closed the majority of the time. Otherwise, house full of flies. Hopefully, you keep the TV closed most of the time. <laughs> Otherwise, it's a big open door for Satan. There might be some good stuff on there sometime, but it ain't on there all the time. And there's many other things that I could say. Sometimes the books on your shelf let Satan in. Sometimes it's the radio stations. Sometimes it's the mail person delivers stuff to your house. And you pick it up out of the mailbox and bring it right in and lay it on the counter. And Satan just got an open door right into your house. I'm just telling you, you've got to be careful with Satan because he's powerful and he's sneaky. How do I know Satan's powerful? Other than what Paul has said here, how do I know he's powerful? Let me give you just a few things here. Uh, and, and I'm not going to have us turn to all of these, but let me just mention them. Take a note. Jot it down. And, and don't just believe it because I say it. Believe it because you took it home and studied it and know that it's so because you studied it yourself. Jesus himself referred to Satan three times in the Gospel of John as the prince of this world. Three times, Jesus, the God, the creator of all things, the, the savior of the whole world, said of Satan, he is the prince of the world. It's in John 3, 30, uh, 12, 31. It's in John 14, 30. It's in John 16, 11. All three times, Jesus speaking, all three times referring to Satan as the prince of this world. That word prince, it means First in rank or power. It means the chief ruler. That's literally what the word means. And Jesus said, Satan is the chief ruler. He is the one in the first rank or power in this world. Listen, Jesus himself said, you need to be careful with this guy. You want to know who's in, in charge? Say, so, well, God's in charge. Well, ultimately that is so. But on this earth, in this realm, in this age that we're living in, for a reason that God knows and, and I can allude to and, and I can give hints about, Satan has taken over. We're going to look at how he got control in a moment. But know this, even Jesus conceded that, that Satan is the prince of this world right now. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 4, the Bible says there, Paul again writing, said that Satan was the god of this world. We don't have time to turn there. I'm running out of time as it is. I just want to lay this out as a foundation for you. His titles. How do I know Satan's power? How do I know he's powerful? Because of the titles that God has given him in his word. He is the god of this world, Paul writes in, in, in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. In Ephesians 2.2, Paul says of him again, he is the prince of the power of the air. I'm just saying, th these are the descriptions of Satan right now in this age that we're living in. Then I also consider this, not only the titles that he's given and the descriptions of him, but what about his abilities? What about the abilities that he is ascribed to have uh, accomplished? 
In 2 Timothy 2.26, the Bible refers there, Paul writing to Timothy, he says that Satan has taken the world captive at his will. He has taken the heart, the mind, the spirit captive of the lost people at his will. In Ephesians 2.2 2 again, Paul writing to the Ephesians says that he is the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Why do unsaved people do what unsaved people, why do disobedient people do what disobedient people do? Because it's the power of Satan in their life. And li- understand something, don't say, oh preacher, now I can see, it's, God, it's Satan's fault, Satan made me do it. No, he didn't. And I'll get to that explanation here in a minute. His abilities. Uh, look with me at this one, Revelation chapter 12, verse number 9, Revelation 12, 9. That's an easy one to flip to, right there in the back. Revelation chapter 12, verse number 9, talking about the ability of Satan. Notice what God says that Satan's going to have the ability to do uh, in this particular uh, point in time, at this particular point in time. Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Satan is such that he can deceive the whole world. That ought to make shivers run up and down your spine. Look at uh, verse. Um, look at verse uh, chapter thirteen, verse number fourteen. Since you're right there. <laughs> It says, and deceive them, deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by any means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had, uh, had the wound by the sword and did live. Notice here, the miracles which he had power to do. Satan is powerful, and he can give that power and grant that power and do great miracles. <laughs> In the book of Revelation, we also find that he's going to get most of the world to fall down and worship him. Consider this. Maybe you haven't thought about this before, but maybe you have. In Matthew chapter 4, verse number 1, we have the Lord Jesus Christ early in his ministry... And it says that someone came along and tempted him. Y'all know who that was, don't you? Satan even had... Now think about this. This is deeper than you thought it might be. Or or than maybe you thought it was. Jesus Christ was tried. What would it take to tempt... Jesus Christ to sin. That'd be pretty powerful temptation. A temptation was set before the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen, if it wasn't possible, if it wasn't within the realm of possibility, what te- it wouldn't have been a temptation. But it says that Satan tempted the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 1 there, then was Jesus led up of the spirit of the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. He's powerful. If he can come up with something to tempt our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he's powerful, friends. Don't, Don't make any mistakes about this. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4 and 5, I think it is. It talks about him blinding the minds of the unbelievers. I've been asked this. I've thought this myself. I've had conversations about this. How can the world around us be absolutely so blind to not see things that, they, that, that seem so obvious to me and to you and to others? How can it be that, that, that it just, some of this stuff just is like, 
blows my mind how we can be as a world, as a, as a country, as a people, so he's blinded their minds. That's how powerful he is. I'm just saying he's powerful. His titles show it. His abilities show it. His offers and his claims show it. Think about this, Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 5. That's where uh, he, the serpent came to Eve. Now, he lied to her. He deceived her. He beguiled her, according to her testimony. But he claimed, in those verses, he claimed to know more than God knew. Now, we all know that's not true. But he said, you shall not surely die. You shall be as gods, he told her. I happen to believe that Adam was there. But he claimed to know more than God. Now think about this. This, this probably blow your mind away. In the temptation, Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 to 10, one of the temptations, and again the devil spake, uh, speak, taketh him up into the, an exceeding high mountain, showing, showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. So they're on the highest peak and the highest pinnacle. You have Satan, you have the Lord Jesus Christ, and Satan is saying, all right, look around. He's showing him all the kingdoms from that point of view. And all their glory, all the, the, the powerful good things about these kingdoms. In verse 9, he saith unto him, all these things, now get this, will I give thee. We have Satan offering to give Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. Wait a minute. You can't give something that isn't yours. But he's the prince of the power of the air. He's the prince of this world. He's the God of this world, according to the Bible. So he is offering to the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the way, created it, He's now offering it back to him. Under the condition, of course, that you fall down and worship me. But he said, I will give it you. I'll yield it back to you. Talk about someone with power. We, we sing the song, we have the thought that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth in every mine. And it's true. But God's not in control of it. According to this passage, according to this context, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He has somehow gained control over the world. And God has sent Jesus Christ into the world to redeem us out of the world. He said, you're not of the world if you get saved and trust Christ. You have another home, another kingdom, another father, another king. So the question then needs to be asked, how did he get this power? How did Satan get into this position of ownership, of authority, of power in the world? Now I want to take you back to the Garden of Eden, chapter number 2, Genesis chapter number 2. Notice with me verse number 7. Genesis chapter 2, number 7. It says this. Genesis 2, 7, not 7, 2. That's for a different time. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Who made it? God made it. And every man became, and man became a living soul. Notice chapter 15. Or verse 15, rather. Chapter 2, verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. To dress it and keep it. Who's now responsible for the world? God created it all. And then what does he do? He takes the man that he created and he puts him in the garden that he created. And he says, you are to dress it and to what? Keep it.
He gave man the orders and the authority to dress it. That means put everything in order or to arrange. That's the word. But then he says to keep it. What does that mean? To retain in one's possession or in power. To have custody over. Do you know who's supposed to have power over this world? Who's supposed to be in control? We are. Who did God give control and authority? To man, to Adam. Do you know how Satan got it? <laughs> Genesis chapter 3. Verse three, chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. You realize that man handed Satan the reins in the Garden of Eden? We gave him control. We surrendered our authority, our possessional rights to the world. It's falling apart because you handed it off and I handed it off to the enemy. Now, I don't want to make your blood pressure rise. I don't want to make your heart skip a beat. But our country just for the last 20 years... Y'all know where I'm going with that, don't you? And then we said, here you go. And by the way, here's all the weapons you need to go ahead and do it again. Why do you hand the control and the authority back to the enemy? All right, it's a dumb thing, isn't it? It's a dumb thing. But guess what? Not only did our government do it recently, but we did it as a, as a tribe, as a people, many, 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 many years ago. And you know what the saddest thing about all that is? Nearly each and every day of our lives, we do the same thing. Now consider this. Follow along with me here. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Think about the implications of that verse and what that means. When Jesus Christ saved you, if you're saved, if you've called on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, you've repented of your sin, you've turned to, to God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you've called on him for salvation, you're saved. You're no longer under the power of Satan. You've been set free. Your chains have been broken. You're a new creature in Christ. Uh, old things are passed away. All things have become new. You, he has no authority over you anymore. You've been bought with a price, paid for with the blood. And then we pick up the remote and we open the window. We take out our device, whether it be a small one or a big one, and, and, and we open up the window. You know why Satan is wreaking havoc in the world today? Not only in the lost world, he owns them. I'm talking about in Christians' lives. You know why he's having such a good time with us? Because we leave the door open. We leave the window open. We invite him in by what we invite into our homes and into our lives. Hmm. But friends, we can close the door. We can keep the flies out if we're determined to do so. We're in the world, but we're not supposed to be of the world I take you back in your mind to Job. And let me remind you, consider Job. Consider my son Job said God to Satan. Have you considered my son Job? A righteous man, one that excuse evil? You, re you remember what Satan said to God about Job? In that, listen to this. 
In Job chapter 1, verse number 10, here's what Satan says to God. Hast thou not made an hedge about him and about uh, his house and about all that he hath on every side? Man, friends, don't you wish God would put a hedge about your life and, and say, Satan, you're not welcome in this? Wouldn't that be a blessing? Satan would have to ask permission from God to come into your world, into your life, into your house, into your family. Listen, every into his house and about all that he hath on every side. God was even protecting his ox and his sheep and his camels and his asses and his servants and everything that Job had. Why? Because he was a righteous man and eschewed evil. Because he lived for God. Because he didn't open the door for Satan. He didn't open the window for Satan. At every turn, at every avenue, at every opportunity, Job kept the door shut. You know the challenge that we have today? You probably do. But I'm going to tell you anyway. Satan has created so many avenues and so many opportunities for himself to get into our life that it, it, you're, you're spinning in circles, closing the windows. It's kind of like the flies at the Kiefer household. There's four doors to exit my house and lots of windows. And there is not many Many uh, minutes of the day, many hours of the day, certainly, that you don't hear me or my wife or one of the other adult kids in my house going, the doors, the flies. You have to have a constant vigil. And friends, Satan only needs a brief moment to get in there. You know, there are times that I go through my, my kitchen and, and, and living room area, and school room area right there, with a fly swatter, killing every single one of them until I can't find another one. Then I think, okay, I need to go to the bathroom. And I go to the bathroom, and I come back out, and I go, where'd all the flies come from? There wasn't one left in here when I left the room. I wasn't gone that long. Satan's sneakier than that. He's quicker than that. I want you to think about what Satan said to God. Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? You know what Satan was saying? I can't get him. You're telling me, look at Job, and what I'm telling you is, you've made it so that I can't get to him. Now what happened there? I already said, Job 1.1, 1, 1, he was a perfect man. He was, he was complete. He was an upright man. He was straight and just. He was a God-fearing man. He was morally uh, uh, reverent to God. And he eschewed evil. It says he... You know what eschewed evil means? Let me give you a today's vernacular of he eschewed evil. He turned it off. If I was going to if I was going to say eschewed evil today, it would be this: turn it off. Turn off the television. Turn off the radio. Turn off the internet. Turn off the opportunities. Shut the door. Shut the window. Decline the offers from Satan. You know why Satan couldn't get into Job's life? You say, well, God was protecting him. Yeah, why? Because Job kept the door shut. See, Satan needs an opportunity. That's all he needs. Now, in, in Job's case, the accusation was, the only reason he's living for you is because you're protecting him. And, and God said, all right, I'll take away my protection for a moment, and you can have your way. Go ahead. Job still skewed evil. He still feared God. He didn't charge God foolishly. He didn't do anything wrong. He was a right and righteous man through that whole process. Now think about this. He didn't let Satan in. 
Why did not Satan get victory even after the first attempt, even after the second attempt, even when Job's friends so-called came and accused him? Why did Satan not have access to Job's life? Because he did not let him in. He didn't let him in. Do you know why Satan has such free reign in the world today? We let him in. So here's my encouragement, here's my counsel. Look at 1 John chapter number 4. 1 John chapter number 4, verse number 4. 1 John 4, 4. He says this, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. What's God telling us? As a child of God, Satan can't touch us. He has no authority. He has no power in my life. Look at the next verse. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth us not. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Jump to the next chapter, chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. It says, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Can I suggest to you that you don't have to let Satan in, no more than Job had to let Satan in? Job has two avenues to get to you. In Job, uh, Satan has two avenues. In Job's case, he had to go to God directly. In most of our cases, we left the door open. We leave the window cracked. Ephesians 6.13 tells us that we need the whole armor of God. We need the whole armor. Helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, uh, uh, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We need the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But sadly, most people, even Christian folk today, haven't even tried their armor on. Haven't even tried their armor on. Look at Revelation chapter 12. Let me give you a thought from there real quick. Friends, we need to be prepared. Satan is in control. You, you, once you get out there in the world, Satan's in control. It's his. Yes, God is going to take it back at some point. Jesus is going to come. He's going to wipe out all the armies. He's going to take out all the world leadership. He's going to take Satan and, and his beat, and he's going to cast them into the lake of fire. He's going to win. But right now, we're living behind enemy lines. You know, it's, uh, it's been a little scary for me lately to consider some of our people, American citizens living behind Afghan lines, still stranded in Afghan Taliban territory. Can you imagine what it would be like? I mean, think about that. If you walk outside the door of your house, you think they could tell the difference between me and one of them? All they got to do is have their eyes open. All they got to do is have me say a word or two, and they would know instantly that I am not from there, I am from America. And my life would be instantly in danger. Can you imagine living behind them? Listen, friends, we're behind enemy lines right now. 
That's where we're residing. If you're living, how many of y'all would like snakes in your house tomorrow morning when you wake up? Anybody? Anybody think, man, that would be just awesome if I'd step out of my bed, put my feet on the floor, and something slithers right underneath me. You're saying, no, no, that's not me. That's not the way it would be. It would be chaos at my house if I found a snake in my house, even one tomorrow morning. So let me recommend you shut the door when you go to bed tonight. I would suggest closing the windows. One day, my kids came running to me. Dad, there's a snake outside. Okay, we're on a farm. No big deal. No, it's hanging on top of the patio door over the schoolroom. Patio door, six-foot door, six-foot wide, six-foot tall, six-and-a-half-foot tall, and we have metal siding. The snake has, and this is, this is one of those speckled king sinks, and he's eaten a few mice in his time and maybe a few copperheads. He was a dandy. He was taller than me. And somehow he had gotten up the metal siding and across and was draped across the patio door. You better shut the windows while you're shutting all the doors. But friends, I got, there's, I got news for you. There's somebody more dangerous than snakes. You wake up tomorrow morning and find out Satan got into your house tomorrow night. You're in bigger danger than you can even realize. We're behind enemy lines. You better take some cautions and some precautions. Roman, uh, Revelation chapter number 12, verse 11. I don't know if I told you to go there, but it'd be a good idea. And I'm going to read it right now. It says, And they overcame him, speaking of Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. They said, we're not holding anything back. We're going to live for God. And we're not going to hold back. We're going we're to be all out. And we're going to have victory, because we're going to overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of His testimony. And we're going to stand up for what's right. Listen, all it takes for evil to prevail is for good men to do what? Nothing. Nothing. So friends, my question is this. Have you let Satan in? Most of us have. Just, just to let you in on a secret that shouldn't be a secret. My kids get tired of hearing me say, the door, the flies. And a few seconds later, the door, the flies. And they look at me like, Dad, you're, you, you got a demon or something. What's the matter with you? And I got the fly swatter, the door, the flies. Listen, the last thing I want to find is a fly crawling around on my plate of food. I don't like it. But I like even less Satan crawling around inside my house, inside my heart, inside my family. Now, friends, I realize it's not easy. I realize it's, it's, it's complicated. I realize you've got to stay on your toes and you've got to be careful and you've got you to be on guard. But listen, that's the time that we're living in. I want to encourage you. Protect yourself. you got a portal to Satan. He's got a portal to you walking around in your pocket more than likely if you got one of these. Some of y'all might get as tired of hearing me talk about the danger of that as my kids are, the danger of flies in my house. But I'm not telling you to be because I'm frustrated with you or angry with you or upset or... I'm just telling you, you, you have got danger lurking in your pocket if you've got one of these dudes, especially if it doesn't have any protection on it. You have no accountability for it. My wife can pick up my phone at any time, day or night, look at whatever she wants. Beyond that, I don't know if I've ever told you before or not, but every one of my devices has a 
program on here that takes pictures of everything it sees on my phone every once in a while. It'll just snap a picture and it sends it to her email. Why? Because I've got a portal to Satan and he's got a portal to me. Oh, I, she, she picks on me once in a while. Man, if my phone went off as much as your phone goes off, well, and listen, it's cut down drastically now that I'm not a contractor on top of pastoring and dadding and, and everything else that I do. But people still call, call me and says, hey, can you put a roof? No, absolutely I cannot. Mm-mm. Nope. I can't. Sometimes I wish I knew about half what I do. <laughs> but the point is this. I'm not stupid enough to realize, to think that Satan couldn't get a hold of me. Every one of my electronic devices has that on there that does that. My computer does it. Takes pictures of my screen. Emails it to my wife. It's a little hard to get used to at first, but you know what? It's a good thing. It's a good thing. I want to encourage you, don't let Satan in. Because he will tear your world apart. It was bad for Job when God let Jaten, uh, Satan jump the shrub. But did you ever think about this? When God said, all right, Satan, you can go into his world, and he wreaked havoc on him, it's true. But he only went, and he was only allowed to go as far as God let him go. Do you think Satan will be as kind if you let him in yourself? I don't think. Let's stand together. Satan isn't kind. Satan isn't considerate. Satan doesn't even care about you. He wants you so he can hurt your heavenly father. Let's go to the Lord today. Father, I want to thank you that you're willing to protect and put a hedge about our life. You're concerned about us. And you don't want Satan in our lives, and you're willing to, like Job, protect us. Father, sadly enough, oftentimes we let him into our own lives. Like Adam and Eve, we just surrender it over to him. Leave the door open and just believe his lies. Father, I pray that you'd help us today. That we might check every door, check every window, and we might shut and lock them. And we might stand a vigil and a guard on our hearts and on our lives and on our families. Father, if Satan comes in, it won't be because we let him in. It'll be because you decided to let him in. And thankfully, you'll still have a good grip on the reins. We ask for your blessing. Father, Satan has taken control. He is the prince of the power of the air. And I'm thanking you for salvation this morning and that I've become a new creature in Christ and that you've taken over the ownership of my life. I pray that you'd help us to not... Let Satan back in. We ask for your blessing and we ask for your help today in Jesus' name. Amen. How about it, friends? Maybe you need to shut the door of your life.